I want to thank Alec and Shaori Reese and Laura and Keith Baston for sending these two Allosaurus toys. Uh, we haven't had two of the same toy before, even though it's kind of weird that this one, they're both from Safari Limited, but this one's like slightly worse manufacturing quality. But these do at least look like Allosaurus, uh, which is more than you usually get with toys. We've had more than 20 people request Allosaurus, which is understandable. Allosaurus is an exceedingly popular dinosaur. It is the Carnosaur and has been pretty much since its inception. Uh, it was an 1877 specimen that Marsh described, actually, as part of the Bone Wars. True to form, Marsh had the barest minimum amount of material necessary to distinguish it as a genus. Uh, in fact, he could distinguish it from the other Morrison theropods, but not from other allosauroids from elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we're actually waiting for another specimen from the same type locality to become the neotype, so that we can resolve the issue of what exactly is and is not genus Allosaurus. And because we have known about it for so long, it has entered the popular consciousness as sort of the default theropod. And I think that's a disservice, both to Allosaurus and to other theropods. Because what happens is you wind up diminishing or glossing over the features that make Allosaurus and other Carnosaurs unique. And it means that other dinosaurs, other theropods, get painted with the Carnosaur brush. You have Ceratosaurus becoming Allosaurus with a nose horn, or Tyrannosaurus being big Allosaurus with binocular vision and two fingers on its hands. I've even had people send me in toys that they say are Allosaurus, but really don't have any distinguishing feature that would make them Allosaurus. So this even happens with people who maybe should know better. These were very successful creatures. Their basic Carnosaur body plan was unchanged for about 100 million years, so they must have been doing something right as leggy, compact, solidly built theropods. Allosaurus itself is the most common predator in the Morrison Formation, which is a broad swath of Western North America from about 150 million years ago, which is the end of the Jurassic period. At that time, it would have been floodplains with conifer forests 30 meters high around the rivers with understory of ferns and a scrubland or fern prairie in between them in the wet season and more like a desert in the dry season because it was always warm but only seasonally wet. This was an environment in which the food supply was of pretty low quality for much of the year and that is exactly an environment in which you want to be a large, efficient dinosaur herbivore. This is why we find between five and nine different genera of diplodocid sauropods. So, a predator that specializes in diplodocid sauropods would kind of have it made. Well, not have it made, but at least always have food available. And that might be why Allosaurus uh, outnumbers all other predators in the Morrison and accounts for most of the predator biomass and is present in all geographic areas of the Morrison. You might say that this toy doesn't look much like a sauropod killer. It looks more like a lizard that learned to run on its hind legs, and you would be right in that assessment. For starters, the head is far too small. I have a lot to say about the head, but let me start with, it is not as heavy as you might expect, given that I just made it bigger. It has extra holes in its skull compared to its peers. And when I say peers, I'm meaning other large-bodied Morrison theropods, which is cumbersome to say, so I'm just gonna say peers. <laughs> and in addition to those holes in the skull, it has hollow chambered vertebrae, so it's supporting 
an air sac system and possibly an avian style flow through lung. It certainly has the tetanur and advanced ventilation, all of which would help to keep its lungs moist, which is useful if you're in an arid to semi-arid environment. This isn't the first toy we've had with this sort of elephantine skin texture. And it's actually combining that with bigger folds like a Komodo dragon might have. And the Komodo dragon comparison is apt. Um, their scales do, at least superficially, resemble the tuberculate scales that dinosaurs would have had. I don't know if they're developmentally related to the dinosaur reticula. We have a, about a square foot of skin impression from a juvenile allosaurus from the left side of the body, and that shows two to three millimeter tuberculate scale. That said, it's a little hard to rule out proto feathers for a avitheropod uh, tetanurin because we know that some dinosaurs would have proto feathers on one part of their body and not on others. So even though we have some evidence that it would have had scales on part of its body, that doesn't mean that it did or did not have proto feathers elsewhere. So parsimonious to restore it either way currently. But even though at the size this toy is at, portraying two to three millimeter scales would wind up just looking like asphalt, uh, the more mammalian looking skin wrinkles, really not terribly reasonable. This tail should really be wider. We talked last time about the muscles that run from the transverse processes on the tail vertebrae over to the femur to pull the leg back to propel the animal forward and that means that the tail should be about as wide, if not wider, than the hip bones, and this one is not. The tail should not be this rat-like and whipping about. These are tetanurin dinosaurs, which literally means stiff tails. Uh, all it means is they have these elongated processes on their tail vertebrae that interlock with the previous vertebrae. This is usually interpreted as an adaptation for mobility not strictly making it stiffer like a board, but more that they were able to control the flippity-flop of their tails. Which might explain a mystery whereby we find Allosaurus right alongside other large-bodied Morrison theropods. That is, they're not ecologically segregated. So they must have been niche partitioned by behavior or by feeding strategy. And since the other Morrison theropods are low and sinuous, Maybe they were sneaking through the forests and undergrowth, uh, ambushing the smaller animals, whereas Allosaurus was running out on the plains chasing the, the big game. So these legs are about right for a pursuit predator. Allosaurus had the proportionally longest legs of its peers, um, and the longest feet proportional to its body. The feet on this toy are a little too short. The shins are longer than the femur, which is accurate. The middle toe is too short. You see this a lot on the fingers and toes of Allosaurus, and by extension, a lot of other theropod toys, that they'll restore all three digits the same length. Uh, well, there are four digits because they actually did include the Duke Law on this toy, but the main digits. Uh, that's not accurate. The middle toe, which bore the brunt of walking, was longer. Also, the fingers and toes on this toy are a little skin and bone. This was a two-ton creature. It would have flesh on its feet to pad it as it walked. I don't really mind the splayed posture that this is exhibiting, because I think it's within the animal's range of motion to spread its legs like this. It's not terribly reasonable, but it seems to be sort of an action pose that it's in. I do mind that it's standing on its tail, which it wouldn't do. Its spine should be roughly parallel to the ground. It might be because we have so many individuals of Allosaurus known, but we have a lot of pathologies on Allosaurus bones. Pathologies are infections, deformities, or injuries, things that happened to the animal's bones while it was alive, and we can tell usually because they started to heal. Uh, this is as opposed to damage that happens to the fossil once it's already dead or even once it's already fossilized, which happens all the time. These are interesting because they give us a glimpse into how the animal was living. Uh, in the case of the foot pathologies and the limb bones, uh, it presents a little bit of a mystery because 
For a two-ton animal walking around, you would expect stress fractures, which are little fractures that don't happen as a result of a single violent incident, but are instead from some repeated stressful activity. You would expect them to all be on the middle toe, or at least mostly be on the middle toe, but on Allosaurus, they're spread out between all three toes. Now what in the world was it using its feet for to have stress fractures on all of its toes? And what was it doing that its peers were not? Think about that for later. The shoulder girdle should be further back and the chest lower. This had a short, stiff torso. It didn't have this, let's stack the pectoral girdle on top of the belly somehow. And I don't think you would even see the shoulder blades through the flesh keeping them in place. This had really thin, strap-like shoulder blades compared to its peers. The arms are too spindly. They kind of look like Grover arms or maybe a stretched out crocodile. There's a tendency with Allosaurus, because the first thing a child will learn is, you know, Allosaurus is the one with three fingers and Tyrannosaurus only has two, but that doesn't mean that you have to have the fingers splayed as far as physically possible. Uh, they, in a neutral pose, they would be roughly parallel to the forearm and roughly parallel to one another. I do like that its arms are facing one another. This is an animal that couldn't pronate its hands downwards. Um, it was characterized as a combination grasper clutcher. And the sort of I'm about to hug something pose that it's in might actually be accurate. Um, those meat hook claws on the ends of its fingers might be used to hold on to prey so that it can use its neck and head to dispatch it. Um, we have more stress fractures on the forelimb bones and also um, what's called tendon avulsions, which is where a tendon rips off a piece of bone. Ow. Uh, so we have evidence that they were holding on to something that would really rather not be held and doing so regularly. Bet you didn't expect the hugging pose to be accurate. The neck should be about as wide as the head and it's accurate that it's sharply S-curved. This had the sharpest S-curve among its peers. Um, it had very mobile ball and socket joints as opposed to the flatter joints that you see in like a Tyrannosaur. And it has these wings on the back of its skull called paroccipital processes. And the muscles that attach there give it a powerful ability to move its chin to its chest. This is called ventroflexion. Never play Scrabble with a biologist. So what it's doing is recruiting its powerful neck muscles to push its head downwards through flesh because it doesn't have that strong of a bite. So it needs to make up for it with its neck. Not that any of that would matter since this toy probably wouldn't be able to close its mouth. The curve of the jaw is wrong. It, it, the, the jaws wouldn't fit together at all, and the teeth would be in the dentary bone, not the serangular bone. They're going too far back into the mouth. It's really lantern jawed. The cranium should be higher and the jaw skinnier. And in dorsal view as well, again, I like that it has the horns visible, but this looks in dorsal view kind of like a hadrosaur or something. Uh, it's much more wedge-shaped, Allosaurus's head. Allosaurus actually has proportionally rather small teeth. They're kind of like a varanid lizard teeth, where they're tiny serrated teeth that would work together to cut flesh with many tiny rips. And if you can't close your jaws to actually get a grip on the flesh you're trying to cut through, you're gonna starve to death. When we consider those tiny teeth, I say tiny, but relatively they kind of are compared to like a megalosaurus or something, um, together with some quirks of the skull, we can learn some interesting things about the animal's ecology. There was a gentleman named Lautenschlager who in 2015 did a study of gape in archosaurs, and that's actually where I got this skull. He put his research materials online on Dryad Digital Repository. And based on various rest angles for the adductor muscles, the jaw closing muscles, he determined that, among other things, Allosaurus would have a ridiculous gape. It was right around 80 degrees of gape. And when you have an animal with a wide gape and small teeth, that means that it's engaging with a larger diameter of prey animal. 
Uh, we talked about this last time with Carnotaurus. We know this because the temporal fenestra is a little bit squished front to back, which means that the jaw closing muscles would be thinner, which allows you to open your mouth wider, but also gives you a less powerful bite, which is why we had the neck muscles being recruited into it. More generally, this skull has the shape it does to absorb maxillary forces. If you look at this skull, it's basically a series of arches. And it was Dr. Rayfield and colleagues that did a finite element analysis on an Allosaurus skull and found that it was uniquely suited to redirecting forces that are acting on the upper tooth row, either to reinforced struts or to joints that would bend. They concluded that Allosaurus would have a pretty violent slash and tear method of feeding. Uh, slightly more controversially, they concluded that it would be using its upper tooth row as a hatchet and using a high impact bite uh, to drive its tooth row down into prey. Um, I've always thought that was a really interesting idea because, you know, it doesn't have the bite force of, say, a Tyrannosaurus, but it finds a clever way around that to still go after the large prey. Unfortunately, that might not make a whole lot of sense. This is not a new idea. Backer compared Allosaurus to a Samoan war club, of all things. But first off, we shouldn't conclude that just because an animal's skull could absorb large forces, that that necessarily means that it did. No living animal uses its head as a hatchet, though, so that's a slightly novel feeding strategy, which is going to need some novel evidence. Um, mechanically, it's pretty tough to actually pull off, and I need my visual aids for this. Using my highly engineered examples of dinosaur prey at different gauges. So either this is a smaller animal or it's a smaller part of a bigger animal. Even with the huge 80 degree gape that an Allosaurus would attack with, if it's trying to do a hatchet bite onto a larger animal, it's going to either only be able to engage with the very front of its mouth or it's going to hit jaw first and dislocate or break its jaw, depending on how much force it's acting with. It could probably manage a sort of swiping bite, and this is consistent with what we know about its neck muscles, that it could probably do a Komodo dragon-like lateral pull, but I don't know if that's exactly what Rayfield et al. were talking about, and it would definitely be consistent with the hugging hypothesis that we talked about earlier. The trouble with this is that if it's only getting a nibble on the very front of its mouth, that's not the part of its skull that's really suited to absorbing forces. That's a relatively weak part of the upper tooth row. So what if it hits a smaller animal or a smaller part of that same large animal? Well, then it fares a little better. It's able to actually engage it with the top of its tooth row, but you run into another problem because those parts of an animal or those animals, if it's coming down onto them, you're going to hit the spine or the hip. You're going to hit bone, and you're probably going to shed teeth. And we do actually find a lot of Allosaurus teeth. It's a fairly common tooth fossil. But if you're going to shed teeth with every prey capture, that's untenable. And I don't want to seem like I'm down on Dr. Rayfield and colleagues. I, I absolutely support having more numbers and hard science in paleontology. It's just that jump from these are the numbers associated with this bone to this is the behavior that that would require um, needs to be filtered carefully. And I do wonder if the researchers are mistaken that the hard part about eating a sauropod is killing it. Because even a single sauropod kill is going to yield tons and tons of meat. So I reason that they're going to be spending a lot more energy and a lot more stress processing that kill, defleshing prey. When we put together the strong skull, the pushy neck, and the foot pathologies from earlier, we have a picture of a creature that's expending consistent and considerable energy stripping carcasses, manipulating the carcass with its feet, and 
pushing against it and pulling with its head almost upside down like a kestrel defleshing prey. It's got bird-like posterior pulling and Komodo dragon-like lateral pulling. And putting all of that pressure on your toes is where we get those stress fractures. And putting your feet into a dinosaur carcass is not the most antiseptic of environments, so that's where we get our infections on the foot. And that makes me wonder whether Allosaurus might have been eating tougher animals than its peers, because a Thyreophorin or a Diplodocid might have more work associated with it, getting the meat off of it, I mean, than, uh, than a smaller animal would. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, that's just my own personal speculation. The number of survived, which means healed, infections shows that Allosaurus had a avian reptilian immune response rather than something like a mammal would have. Basically, they keep the infection really isolated, which takes longer to heal, but absolutely prevents it from spreading and poisoning the blood and all of those fun things. That means that depending on where the infection happened, a carnivore could be out of commission for days or weeks. Now as mesotherms, their metabolic needs might be low enough that they could go without food for a few days, and or they could exclusively scavenge during that period, which maybe gets them less food, but it's lower effort food in the first place. Or maybe they had some kind of social safety net. There's been quite a bit written about Allosaurus gregariousness, um, that is having social groups of Allosaurus. And it's possible that if an Allosaurus was out of commission, other members of its family or its pack or whatever you want to call that uh, would take care of it. I don't know that that idea, which is based on pretty circumstantial evidence, uh, holds up to scrutiny, and I really don't think it holds up to environmental stress. And I have a story to prove that. This is the story of the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry in Utah. Two thirds of the individuals in this bone bed are Allosaurus. And there are as many ideas about what happened there to produce this bone bed as there are publications on the site, pretty much. It's usually been interpreted as a predator trap, like La Brea tar pits, but with mud instead of tar. But that isn't really supported by the taphonomy of the site. I am following Dr. Gates' interpretation that the CLDQ is a drought-induced assemblage. Over the course of years, or possibly decades, there's an ephemeral pond. It fills in the wet season from storm runoff or from rivers flooding, uh, and we know it isn't there every season because there's very scant evidence of crocodiles or turtles, and there's no evidence of fish. So grazing animals, which are normally solitary or in small groups, gather into these large aggregations around the remaining bodies of water once the wet season ends. The Morrison Formation has relatively low population density, low number of individuals, but relatively high diversity. So animals weren't usually forming those huge exclusive herds that you see in the late Cretaceous. But drought puts pressure on these aggregations, and we get these multi-species bone beds. The animals start dying off, not directly due to thirst. Rather, having this many herbivores in such a constrained area strips the area of all forage, and the herbivores weaken for want of food. Dinosaurs are uniquely well adapted to arid conditions. For one thing, they excrete very little water. But the sheer volume of food that the giant herbivores take in means that they might not be able to reach another water source. This makes them more susceptible to malnutrition. It makes them uh, fall prey to intraspecific aggression and actual predation. Dinosaur mothers stop laying their eggs. They're more vulnerable to disease, especially with all these rotting carcasses all over the place. There's feces in the water supply probably, which means diseases like botulism become epidemics in the carnivores. So the bottom layer of the quarry is about the same proportion of fauna as the rest of the Morrison. They're dying in the same proportion that they're living. These skeletons lay around the edge of the shrunken pool for months or years. We know this because they were exposed to the air. They dried and they fractured, and they were disarticulated by scavengers and by just other animals trampling the bones. If the rains had returned to normal at this point and the lake had expanded again, we would have a broken up but proportionally representative sample of a normal Morrison ecosystem. 
but the drought continued, which is awesome if you're a paleontologist, but really sucks if you're an Allosaurus. Competition at the site actually favors Allosaurus. Um, obviously, if you have weak herbivores, the predators are going to have a good day at first, but they'll quickly run through the available stock. The presence of a bunch of carnivores at the site deters other animals from approaching, and the modest size difference that exists between Allosaurus and other large theropods starts to tell. This cascades until the only animals present at the site are Allosaurus. The upper layer of mudstone at the quarry is exclusively Allosaurus. And there's a relative abundance of immature individuals, which means that the bigger and the stronger and the older individuals are preying on the young. We have cannibalism, which is a sign of extreme environmental stress. At last, the area becomes less arid and the pond becomes a permanent lake. This covers over the mudstone with a limestone layer and preserves it down to us digging it up today. The Morrison was a tough environment at best, and the animals in it barely clung to life at its worst. There's evidence that a lot of the multi-generic bone beds that we find from Morrison were caused by droughts. So the apex predator of this environment, the Allosaurus, must have been a pretty tough animal to be able to thrive as much as it did, which makes it funny to me that then humans come along and find it and call it fragile. Allosaurus is actually one of my favorite dinosaurs. I don't have a favorite dinosaur, but I have like a grouping and this is definitely in it. So it really bugs me to see all of these generic theropod body with a Komodo dragon head stuck on it toys labeled as Allosaurus. It's so much more than just that one that isn't T-Rex. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Comment in with anything I may have missed or dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. You could send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. I only ask that you not send in a dinosaur that we have already done, a genus we've already done. Uh, and if you need your toy back, please specify that. Go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can get involved with our National Science Center and Makerspace here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we'll see you next time.